excited to be here with Ash Riley. We connected on Instagram because I saw some of her posts were um, the, uh, were kindred spirits uh, critiquing the uh, the coaching industry and the marketing that happens there. And um, she saw, you know, she likes some of my content too. So uh, I thought I would want to just have a conversation with Ash on um, one of the recent threads I saw in her in her private Facebook group. Uh, but first of all, let me just say hi to you, Ash. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> hi, thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. Um, so, well, actually, is there anything you want to uh, say about your kind of your background or, um, you know, why are you uh, critiquing the coaching and marketing industry? Um, what's your experience with it? And what do you do for a living? Sure. Yeah, I actually, I consider myself an ethical marketing and trauma-informed marketing advocate. Nice, um, I like it. I work full time in marketing in higher education. So, you know, this is just something that I do on the side for fun and occasionally people want to pay me for it. And that's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, is, and by the way, I just want to say at, at this at the time of this recording, your um your consulting rate is quite generous, quite um, you know, I mean, for the kind of stuff you 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 do and know. So uh those who are watching this, if you're interested, you can, you know, there's a link to below to Ash's website and you can check that out. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was going to say it's kind of like a, a, a bizarre thing for the coaching industry. You know, everybody's like, what, you don't want to work from home full time and have your own business and be an entrepreneur? And it's like, no, I'm actually perfectly happy. To right. This. I was going to say, yeah, you know, it's it's so interesting. I was um, before this business, I was in higher ed as well. A lot of people don't know I was an admissions director for a graduate program. So <laughs> we have that little bit of a connection. So, all right. So the thread that I wanted to bring up for this conversation that the one, then one that came from your private Facebook group, which I don't know if it's public. I, I, I could link it below too. Is it, I mean, it's, uh, it might be private, but there's, there's a button on my Instagram bio. Okay. You. So it's okay for people to request access. Yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I'll, I'll link it below. Cause I think it's, it, you know, this kind of conversation happens in there, which is um, you had, you were bringing up, someone who had asked you, well, the, the over topic is what happens if we attract an audience who can't or won't pay for our coaching services? Um, and there's, yeah, I'll just kind of let you start. And then I have some other thoughts on that too, but <laughs> go ahead. Would yeah, maybe so give us the context. Yeah. Yeah. So somebody had tagged me uh, in a comment on another coach's post. And that coach had posted something about what to do when a client signs up for your program and then won't make the payments. Um, and, you know, people were talking about, oh, we can send them to small claims court. We can <laughs> do uh, things like that. And I was like, you know, first I would maybe ask yourself why you're attracting clients who can't afford to pay you to begin with. Yeah. Or perhaps those clients are not receiving what they were expecting or perhaps your product's just crap. <laughs> it's harsh, but true. I mean, and when we, yeah, yeah. And when we say what, what happened in this particular situation is this client had already experienced, I guess, some of the program, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that's why the coach was so, surprised and 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 first of all i i it's already kind of unusual that you would allow someone into a program without payment of any kind but i guess maybe that's some people's models like oh yeah you have a have a free trial kind of thing well no what they do is they put you on a payment program and so you okay. are paying like monthly oh i see i see instead of all up front so then they right. pay the the first payment they get in the program they decide they don't like it i see and then they want to back out because a lot of people have, they have no exit clauses right. and they don't give refunds. Yeah. So what other options are you giving them? Right. Then, yeah. then to just not pay you. Right. Yeah. You're yeah. holding them financially hostage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I too have a month to month program. And when someone, uh, you know, when it's not right for them anymore, it's okay. Even though there was a commitment you know, I, I have two programs. One of them, ha, you know, has a clear commitment of a year and the other one has like a, yeah, tentative commitment, but if it's not the right fit, it's not the right fit. And, but, but let's talk about this part. So, so, you know, the, the thread that I read in your private group, like, you know, sometimes you just have to ask for feedback 
from your clients about what's not working for them about it. And yeah, that and, was the first thing I said was like, have you ever thought about asking them why they aren't paying you? Right. <laughs> right. Right. And and it's maybe this ask is, them before you try to yes. take the court. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I can't even I, I would never even go through the legal trouble. It's like, please have your money back or whatever. I don't even want to go through the legal trouble of yeah. or it's like goodbye, you know, thanks for being thanks for giving the try. But but here's the thing, like feedback is such a a lot of people are delicate about it, you know, because well, tell share why you know you, you kind of share share the thing you shared in that thread and let's talk about this like why are people so uh, many coaches are very reluctant or they don't they either don't even think about asking for feedback like it just not even doesn't even cross their mind mm -hmm. i am i mean those people who have worked with me know i'm i'm obsessive about feedback like i, I probably ask for feedback too much like like literally every single thing you attend from me Every single group session, every single one-on-one -on -one session. At the very end, there's immediately uh, the the you know the, I, I program Zoom to do this. Like immediately ask, hey, quick session feedback. You know, any anything I could improve? Anything you want to say to help me? Or what did you take away? What can I improve? Very simple questions. And I ask, but a lot of people don't. And I'm I'm always I'm always honestly I'm always surprised. I think as an entrepreneur, maybe I I have such an entrepreneurial mind that I'm like entrepreneurship is all about making something that others want and it serves their wants and needs and therefore they're very happy to pay for it and how do we know if something is something they want unless we ask. do market research you ask them yeah. but, come, but why I do you think a, i come from a, a tech startup background so like creating products and getting feedback and iterating is like part of the process it's a and must I worked for an agency before that. So it's like a B test everything. You know? right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That's just good marketing. That's good product design. Right. And part of the, the way that I approach marketing, you know, beyond just like, how do, how do we be ethical is um, I like to take a systems thinking approach to it. And for most people, what, when they think about systems thinking, it's like, okay, well, how does the piece that I'm working on fit into the bigger bigger system of the company or whatever, I like to take it up to the global level and ask myself, how do, how does this thing that we're creating uh, or this system that we're working within fit within the social structures of the world? Um, so uh, a lot of what I do is apply sociological concepts to uh human behavior and and then things that we do in terms of how we think in terms of leadership in terms of our strategies and approaches um and so something i've been kind of playing with on my stories lately is this difference in mindset between collectivist cultures and individualist cultures mm. um so america is a highly individualist culture yeah and um the, the difference in the mindset between a collectivist and an individualist culture is huge. Yeah. There is, there are scientific studies that show you that there's a direct correlation in uh, cultural narcissism that correlates with in individualistic societies. Um, we are very much like self oriented and, yeah. and we think about self first over others right. much of the time. And so honestly, I think that has a huge part to play in why a lot of coaches, particularly in America, don't think about asking their clients for feedback because it's all me, 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 me. <laughs> I created this. This is brilliant. If it's not right for you, well, then it's you. And, and then we have this, this aspect of personal branding where we have been conditioned to merge ourselves so deeply with our business that it becomes part of our identity. And when people are questioning your identity, that's threatening, right? Yeah. Wow. That, that, okay. So just that point is really important. Like many of us, most of the people watching this are solopreneurs, you know, and a lot of coaches. Um, and the well, you know, I talk about authentic business, right? Being a natural uh, extension of the passion that we have and the experiences that we have and the skills. And 
yes, we tend to then go so we get so attached that this my business and me are one. Yeah. And so, <laughs> right. so, so it's like, how can I keep maintain healthy boundaries between myself and my business? Where do I end? Where does my business begin? Where does my marketing end? And where do I begin? Because a lot of people have turned themselves into the product. Right. Right. And when yeah. you are the product and people have a problem with the product, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yes. Right. Exactly. Because now they're questioning you as a person and whether you're not a good product, bad product, but good person, bad person, or something like that, you know, worth, yeah. worthwhile and person or not, you know, worthy person. And it doesn't even have to necessarily be the, the, it doesn't have to be the client even making that association. It's just like, you're so heavily identified with your product that if anybody has a problem with it, they automatically have a problem with you. Yeah. In your yeah. Mind. And, right. And yeah. also this is, this relates to uh, this attachment also means if we don't get the kind of response or engagement on our product or our content, it naturally automatically, oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, that's such a big, big uh, reason why people don't create mm -hmm. content or products or, or even the fact that they have a hard time. Like uh, I, I talk, I, I do this all day long. I talk to people who are like, oh, I'm having a hard time, like describing what I do, you know, like, it's like, and I'm, I mean, I'm grateful for this conversation because it's making an aha moment for me about this separation between product and person, because I, like I said, maybe, maybe I, because I grew up, uh, I had a, I was going to say, I have a, I have a, I have a, um, a dad who's a, who's a, you know, a businessman, but he's, I really learned a lot of entrepreneurship like myself in the quote unquote, in the past, you know, 12, 13 years of experimenting. And I have a very, yeah, like productizing my service and my program. It's like, it's like, I don't mind taking just one little aspect of what I like and do and turning that into a product. Whereas people are like, I must, it must encompass everything that I, I am. And it's like, no wonder you have a hard time describing what you do. I mean, how can you, how can you put all that, all of the whole of who you are into five words or something like that? You know? Yeah. 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 Let's, it's yeah. I so, know the elevator pitch is important and, and it has a use, but you can't cram all of it into one, into one yeah. sentence. Or, or, or by the way, even into a sales page. I mean, I, I have, <laughs> so it's like, no, 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 this is just one little aspect of what I do. And, but back, back to the original topic of, of attracting people that can't or won't pay for what we do. Um, what do you, what, yeah. What, what do you say to someone who says, well, okay, let's, even before someone signs up for our coaching program and can't make the payments, let's just say prior to that, oh, what if you are having you know, people may, who may even have commented on your social media posts or may even have messaged you, you know, privately for, hey, want to pick your brain on this one thing. And maybe you're very nice and you respond back to them. But then yeah, at some point you're like, well, maybe they should become a client or uh, you reach out to one of your commenters uh, about, you know, a coaching program you have. And the person says, oh, you know, I can't afford it. What is your, I don't know, guidance or the perspective on that? If somebody says they can't afford it, believe them. <laughs> believe them. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes people will tell you non-confrontational people might give you an excuse for why they can't do the program. But they're telling you an excuse because they don't want to do the program. Yeah. My, my perspective on sales is um, people have to be ready, they yeah. have to be willing, and they have to be able. Right. If they are not ready, willing, or able, they are not going to buy a product. Right. And you should not try to coerce them right. beyond right. being ready or beyond being able. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, or beyond being willing to, yeah. to, do, to do the thing. Um, right. And that's yeah. a huge aspect of, of trauma-informed marketing, which is something else that I'm very passionate about, is respecting people's boundaries. Yep. And th there's so much financial abuse happening in the coaching industry. It's insane. Yes. Like, I have people messaging yes. me, telling me that they've spent upwards of $50,000 that- Yeah. No, I, I've- recently had just had someone say that to me too. Can't get, yeah. can't get a refund. It was nothing. The coach like didn't even 
provide the things that they promised. And I've had people tell me they're in therapy now because of all of their experiences yeah. with all of this. They're in debt. I've seen people post about, I'm about to lose my house. What do I do with my two kids? It's, and it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they, and the, the responses that people give these people is it also just makes you cringe because they're, they're using neurolinguistic programming to be like, what if you could imagine that wasn't the case <laughs> as though you're going to magically manifest a house payment. And it's just like, you're, you're, you're gaslighting these people out of their lived experience. Right. Yeah. And that is harmful. Yeah. So a huge part of trauma-informed marketing is about understanding uh, the ways that trauma impacts how people engage in mm -hmm. any kind of relationship, it, how you engage in a personal relationship, in an intimate relationship, you're going to have the same issues with a coach yeah. because it is also an intimate relationship. Right. It's not as intimate, right. but it is a one-to-one -one relationship. Yes. And you know, if you have people who are prone to fawning, um, have a hard time saying no, they're going to, they're going to, number one, especially if you have like a huge platform, right. Um, and you are like a star in their eyes, right. Those people are extremely susceptible to suggestion. Extremely suggestible. Yeah. And that's what happens a lot of times is you, you have these coaches, they create these huge personal brands with these lavish lifestyle branding. Right. Yeah. And they love bomb all of their potential clients. Okay. Describe, like, describe that word because, or yeah, explain that. Cause it's so interesting. Maybe I'm not, I'm just, I'm just not up on the, on the current lingo. I just not too long ago learned about that word, but, and I, I, I think some people, probably don't don't even know what that means yet so what, yeah. what does that mean so looping this back to the high level of cultural narcissism okay uh love bombing is a tactic that is used by narcissistic abusers and cult leaders and people who recruit for cults um where they shower you with approval and praise and affection mm, yeah to lure you in right and right. to get you hooked and then they slowly start to either pull away or chip away at your sense of self or abuse you in various other ways. Well, you know, what, what's interesting is that, oh my gosh, I, well, I mean, you could just say that that's uh, some salespeople do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, They're trained right? to do that. Right. Every single cold DM you get starts with a flattering. Yes. Sentence. Yes. And, 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 uh, and, and what I, what I got so annoyed at, um, so early on, which is why I started critiquing my industry is they give you so much more affection and attention in the sales process than they do afterwards, after you've already bought. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, that's, the whole, like, that's the whole purpose. The whole purpose is to draw you in. Right. And so they create these, these big personal brands with you know, a hundred thousand followers and they basically build, it's called a parasocial relationship where, um, the people who follow them don't actually know them, but they create this illusion of vulnerability. Right. And yes, like intimacy that's right. not actually real Yeah, as a way to, uh, endear people to them. Right. And then that way, when that person is ready to sign up for the program, they're very easily taken in. Yeah. Very easily. And yeah. once they get into the program, they're willing to do whatever you tell them. And they're like, oh, you're so coachable. But really, it's like you're so programmable. Right. Because yeah. they're, they're, when you're in that state of mind where you're mm. like this open, uh, exploratory kind of. Yeah mindset your critical thinking skills go Psh. yeah and it's very easy for people to be manip manipulated wow and and i i mean what you're talking about is on a spectrum and i think every 
teacher, coach, program leader, mentor, guru has to be aware of this. Mm -hmm. And because that's a big, I, part of, big part of trauma yeah. marketing is understanding power dynamics. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, because yes, like, like sometimes I start, like I, I tell, I tell people, listen, you know, like I have to, I have to constantly watch myself not to not start a cult <laughs> because I've been part of cults before myself. And I mean, I've been part of a religious cult and I've been part of a business cult. I mean, there are different kinds of cults, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm very aware, like I'm, I'm almost, um, I, I have to admit, I sometimes overcompensate on either self-deprecation or like making a fool of myself because I don't want people to make yourself feel human. To, to, I don't want people to guru eyes, guru eyes me, you know, and, 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 and sometimes, I mean, th this conversation is very enlightening because I'm like, sometimes I'm surprised how, like, sometimes I teach a concept almost to like, see what kind of pushback I get because I want pushback. I want people to say, well, but what about this? But it doesn't work in that situation. I want that because like I said, I'm assessed, I'm, I'm assessed about feedback and I want people to go to challenge me so we can, we can find a more uh, whole truth together, you know? Right. And sometimes I'm surprised when I don't get that pushback and people go, Oh yeah, that's so brilliant. Oh, it's, Everything you say is amazing. And, I, and I'm I, like, I, would do, I used to do just like little social experiments. Um, there, there is, so I had a, before I was doing the marketing stuff, I had this a spirituality blog and oh, there's this okay. website, it's called the new age bullshit generator. And literally it's just like a, a random program that randomly comes up with these like very <laughs> spiritual sounding paragraphs that are just complete and total crap. And I posted one to my like brand yeah. account just to see how many people would like and share it. Right. And it was scary. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, so that's how you really start to understand like the, the dynamics of crowd psychology and. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that, that is, that's another reason that I kind of do what I do is because marketing is founded on this stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it, Edward Bernays is the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he took crowd psychology and applied it to business and marketing and public relations. Prior to that, his job was to do war propaganda. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Like this yeah. is the foundation of marketing and advertising is manipulation. Yes. And, and so for us to be able to do this ethically, we have to go all the way back. Yeah to what master is this serving and what is wrong with how it's being done. Right. Um, yeah. I, I have a, an ebook that I just put together with like, kind of just like a, a, a running list of all these different kinds of like psychological manipulations that are used in marketing. But the, yeah. in the intro kind of give this history of marketing advertising with some really, really telling quotes. Um, and the first one is, is about Edward Bernays and, and sort of like his view of humans being um, very, very shepherdable. <laughs> mm. And um, the other one is this quote from a, a guy who worked for Lehman Brothers back in the 20s, talking about how they need to train Americans into a desires culture, not a needs culture. Wow. They wow. need to be trained to want something new almost as soon as they've already bought it. Right. In order to drive capitalism. And it's done very, very well for America. It's done very, very well. Yeah. It's amazing. That, that, wow. You know, uh, this is the stuff that should be taught in schools. Yeah. Um, from the very <laughs> beginning. And, and, and I learned bits and pieces of this in school, but it was never, it was never yeah. presented in this way no <laughs> it's yeah. always I mean, like positive twist <laughs> yeah yeah and and or it's just not applied enough there's not enough examples of it so that we can actually put it on with that you know put, put those lenses on and see oh okay and the thing about the power dynamics so so interesting too um there is zero understanding about that among most instagram influencers oh yeah i yeah, mean yeah. All, all of this stuff it would just and yeah, that like this needs to be said so often, you know, and it's so funny because um, 
I feel like I, I, I I'm glad you've studied this stuff because I feel like I've kind of come to this out of my own sense of like conscience, like something's not right here, you know? Yeah, and and so I my my degree is in marketing. Um, well, my my degree is in journalism, but I where I went to school, oh, we okay. we had advertising was in the journalism school. Right. Um. So it was like an emphasis. Yes. Um, so we, we learned about Edward Bernays in my PR class. Mm -hmm. Um, we learned about the whole like needs, desires thing in consumer behavior. Uh, so I've had that foundation, but you know, they don't, they don't teach it in an anti-capitalist framework. Um, so I had to, you know, sort of like come to that realization on my own because America is never going to teach you anything anti-capitalist. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that goes directly against our values. Yes, <laughs> right, right. But to a degree, branding also is what yeah. kind of brought me here too, because understanding branding is like learning your values and, and building out your messaging around that. Well, we have cultural values too, not just personal values. And a lot of our right. personal values are entwined with our cultural values. So where do our cultural values come from? Well, they come yeah. from colonialism. They yeah. come from white supremacy. Yeah, they come from individualism. Yeah, <laughs> they come from some not great places. You know, uh, this is personally applicable to me right now because um, I I recently launched a, a group program, and I was relaunching the program because I was basically rebooting it for the current students. So, like, they were overwhelmed and they wanted to just revisit the the lessons and of getting even more material. So I'm like, okay, let me, let me, let's just reboot the whole thing and let's revisit each of the core lessons and be more mindful about applying things. And I said, well, might as well let a few more people into the program. And so it was a very casual thing. And I'm like, oh, well, sure, I'm, I'm relaunching it now. And I was like, great, if 10, 10 more people join, that's great. And at this point, there's 70 more people who've joined. And I'm like, I, I see this dynamic within myself. Like, I, I should stop. I should, I should stop because... I should take off the ability to join the program because, um, you know, with a d- each additional person, that means less time and Q and A for for everybody. And so, um, but it's I think so that's important. So that that's an important point too in terms yeah. of trauma informed marketing because a lot of people think about trauma informed. Oh, you want to you want to just be tending right. to the needs of the the person, but it's also about tending to your needs, right? Because if you are uh, stretching yourself too thin, you're not yes. going to be able to show up for those people. Oh my gosh. And, and it's like, w- what's assumed, you know, it's like, if I had a, if I had a normal marketing coach, they'd be like, great, open it up more and do another launch, tell people. And it's like, well, at some point I, I it becomes bad customer service. Every, <laughs> everything that marketing does is quantity over quality. Oh yeah. Because yeah. the intention is to make more money. Yeah. Right. Like, well, that is of course, you wouldn't make more money, and if, and of course, you charge more. And and actually, it's like, I I I came to this realization some time ago. I'm like, why isn't like, I am I want to take less money, like I I'm care I'm actually conscious, and my conscience is saying, how much money are you taking from people? And it's like I, I I'm I'm like because there's that there's that uh, pressure as their audience grows. There's the pressure to charge more and have even more people sign up for stuff. I'm like, I want to take less money from people. And I have always, <laughs> I have always looked at, so that's one strategy, cap yeah. it. Um, but like, I have always kind of looked at, at, I look at my strategy for all this is how do I manage growth? Not yeah. how do I force growth? Right. Like grow yes. it organically. Yes. Yes. And learn how to manage that yeah. growth as yeah. opposed to strategically trying to grow to an overnight. Success. Oh, yeah. Right. So, so it's like, okay, if I get to a point where I have too many people signing up and I can't ha- handle all of them, right. If I raise my prices, fewer people are going to sign up. Yes. Exactly. So that's yeah. one management strategy. Yes. 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 And, but the, of course, the other management strategy is to just put a cap on it. Just put a cap on it. Exactly. No, I, I, I agree <laughs> with, it's like, if we are raising our rates, it also means we are raising the stakes for us in terms of providing value to them in a way that they're like, oh, wow, what a great deal. This is still a great deal. And, you mean you can't just charge your worth? 
<laughs> no, that's a whole other topic, right? Oh my gosh. Well, I, I just, I mean, we could talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, and and I realize our, our time is already up. Folks, you can get a lot more of this kind of conversation, um, this uh, very enlightening deconstructing of marketing and of the coaching industry and of business, uh, and then finding a way that's really compassionate and I think truly sustainable and, and sustainable for uh, our own business, our own um, way of adding value in an authentic way to our customers and our clients, and therefore feeling really good about what we're doing in our work and also sustainable for the people that we're serving. Um, so take a look at the links below here to Ash's um, Instagram and website, and I think you'll get a lot out of uh, what she's providing. So. Thank you so much, Ash, for what you do and the way that you do it. Yeah, thanks for having me.